Hi everyone and welcome to the Parents Information and Q&A evening for the Faculty of Sciences at the University of Adelaide. My name's Amanda Abel and I'm Deputy Dean for Learning and Teaching in the Faculty of Sciences and I'm really happy to welcome you here this afternoon or this evening uh, to find out a little bit more. I'll also introduce my colleague Ari or allow him to introduce himself as well. Hi everyone, I'm Ari. I'm the team leader of student recruitment in the Faculty of Sciences. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you all here. So I'd like to first of all start off this evening's uh, event by acknowledging the, Ka the Kaurna people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the other lands from which people may be joining us if you're from somewhere else and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in this webinar. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, you all for joining us as parents because uh, being a parent is probably going to be a little bit of a roller coaster over this next day as your students wait for their SACE results uh, tomorrow. Um, and I acknowledge that this is a really big, uh, significant transition period in the life of uh, you as a parent and also the life in your student. As parents and caregivers, you play a really huge role in the transition from secondary school uh, into university. And I'd like to thank all of you for giving your valuable time, not only tonight, but for all, this, all of the support that you provide um, our students with uh, in the future. Before we get started, I'd like to also just um, tell you a little bit of housekeeping, do a little bit of housekeeping. If you've got any uh, questions, can you please use the Q&A section to submit your questions and we'll address them at the end. If you've got any technical difficulties, please use the chat and uh, we'll try to sort those out. Hopefully you won't have any of those. And also we'll be sending out the presentation slides and this recording of the event so you can have access to this content as a reference. So uh, we'll send that out uh, overnight. So without further ado then, I'd like to just uh, get started and let you know what our overview for the night is. So first of all, we'll talk about the SATAC process and also the roadmap that takes our students uh, to semester one, 2021. We'll also look at the mentoring program that we have for students pre-arrival and we have one of the mentors here to uh, talk to us tonight. We'll also talk about a little bit of the, uh, sorry, we'll talk a little bit about the support services that are available uh, for uh, your child. And uh, we'll hear from the panel about their experiences, not only our uh, one of our pre-arrival mentors, but we'll also be hearing from a parent, a parent tonight, which is really great. Um, so we can hear about uh, their experience of being a parent for our student that's made the transition to university as well. And then we'll move into our Q&A uh, in terms of uh, what uh, we've either been sent uh, pre or pre the event in terms of during registration or those that come through in the Q&A as well. Now we're tag teaming tonight, so there'll be a bit of a swap between Ari and I at different points in time and this is the first of those swaps, so I'll hand over to Ari to take us through um, the SATAC roadmap. Thanks Amanda, that was perfectly smooth. We have clearly practiced those transitions really, really well. Um, no, no worries, thank you everyone. Um, so what is coming up over the next few weeks and obviously there's tomorrow with year 12 results what's coming up over the next few weeks is going to be quite fast and there's a lot of different things to keep track of so we've put together a timeline for you to outline the the key milestones and steps leading all the way up to when university starts on the 1st of march in 2021 um, your child should have received a pack in the mail which contained a, a science survival guide there's a more detailed version of this timeline in there and there's also a fridge magnet version of this timeline so if you haven't seen that pack please try and rate it as soon as you can and get that magnet and stick it on the fridge it will make everyone's lives a lot easier um, and it will just help you keep track of everything that's going on so i'll zip through the first few points quite quickly and then as we go along for the next few minutes i'll jump into a few of them in more detail on the 7th of December, we launched our pre-arrival mentoring program. We'll cover that shortly. 
The December 8th date is more for people who have already deferred from a previous year and have the ability to enrol a little bit early. Don't panic, that won't take places away um, from your child if they're a school leaver finishing year 12 this year. I don't think I need to highlight the December 14 event since we are already here. But the key thing is tomorrow. So SACE results will be released tomorrow, December 15th. The results will be available on the SACE website. Um, and your child is actually able to check their adjusted score. So that's their ATAR plus any adjustment factors, which were previously known as bonus points, on their SATAC application. So not on SACE, on their university application. So that's a new feature that was brought in last year. So instead of having to call the university and wait on hold for quite a long time, they can check it automatically on the university application. Um, if they have not actually submitted a university application yet, then they can call the university and we'll guide them through it. The same thing again will happen on January the 2nd when the IB diploma results are released. Then we move along to January the 7th. So this is the SATAC change of preference deadline. So this is the last opportunity for your child to change their preferences on their university application, whether that's adding and removing things or changing the order. Um, We'll go into a bit of detail later on about why the order of preferences is important, but it's just worth noting that that is the last chance to change their preferences before the first round of offers. Then on the 12th of January, we'll be hosting another online event. This will be targeted more towards your child, talking about what happens through the offer process all the way through to enrollment. Um, it's a great opportunity to get as many questions answered as possible. And of course, you are still more than welcome to attend, whether that's as individuals or whether you're sitting there um, right next to them, making sure that they're paying attention. Um, on January the 15th is the first round of SATAC offers, and I'll go into that in just a moment. Then on the 20th of January, we're hoping to welcome the students on campus for a, a smaller scale event pending restrictions. Um, this will be just a general information overview, quite a short talk, followed by a tour and an opportunity to meet some of the first year coordinators. Um, so the people that will be teaching into the first year subjects across all of the different degrees. Orientation commences in the week of February 22nd, and then semester begins on the week of the 1st of March. So that's a lot of information. So as I said, get that fridge magnet if you can. And we'll jump into a little bit more detail about offers now. So offers are sent out by SATAC through email. Um, now the emails that go out, the first offer round date will be the 15th of January. There'll be a subsequent offer round on the 28th of January, the 2nd of February, and then they'll continue making offers weekly until March. The key thing with this is to make sure that your child has used a personal email, not a high, a high school email. Those typically expire at the end of the calendar year. Um, and some people don't get the notification that they've received an offer. It's still there, but they don't get their email. So it's just worth getting them to change that if they haven't already. Offers will be emailed progressively throughout the day. Don't panic if it's not in their inbox at 9 a.m. It's quite common that they don't get all the offers out until late in the afternoon. Also, just make sure you check that junk email folder. Now, I mentioned earlier that preferences are important, and this is where that really comes into play. So students will only ever receive one offer per round, for the highest preference that they are eligible for. So this means that SATAC will look at those preferences from one to six. If they meet the requirements for preference one, they'll send them an offer. If not, they'll move to two. If they meet the requirements, they get an offer. If not, they'll move to three. So once an offer is issued, they stop looking any further. So if there is something that your child really wants to study, the higher up it is on the preferences, the, the sooner it will be considered for, against their eligibility. So that is just something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that is really important is no matter what order of preferences, no matter how good their ATAR is, the most important thing is that if they have not paid their SATAC application fee, they will not be considered for an offer. So please just double check that. Chances are they've used your credit card, so you'll hopefully know if they've done it or not, um, but just to keep that one in mind. Once they receive an offer, there are six different possible responses. So they'll log on to their SATAC account and they'll have the opportunity to respond to their offer. So the one that we generally encourage people to do, especially if it's a University of Adelaide offer, is click accept. Um, but that is also obviously up to the individual. So if it is their first preference, SATAC actually automatically accepts the offer on their behalf because that was the degree they were most interested in getting a place in. It auto accepts. If they change their mind, that's absolutely fine as well. They can go in and change those responses. Um, if your child is sent an offer to their lower preference, so let's say their third preference, um, and they really still want to get preference one, they can still take that offer by accepting it, 
but they can also indicate that they wish to be considered for their higher preferences for admission. If they want to get an offer into any further round, that is absolutely possible. The first offer is not the final offer. It can be in some cases, but it doesn't need to be. In future rounds, you can be considered for an offer as long as the wish to be considered for higher preferences is included in the response to the original offer. So if they get offered their first choice and they've had a change of heart, they can go back into their application the day after offers come out, lower the one they got a place for and put whatever they're more interested in above it. If it's all set and they're all happy with how it is, but they just want it to be considered for something higher, they just need to indicate that. Something that we get asked about quite a lot is whether or not waiting for a further offer round is a, um, is a bad thing. Generally speaking, it's not. Um, that we open up more places in courses within the degrees as we need to let students enrol into them. The only thing that is sort of a minor impact if you leave it for quite a while is that you may not get the perfect times that the, you're looking for in your timetable. So your child might have a, a weird afternoon where they have to come in for two hours, whereas they've blocked everything out. Um, but that's something you can live with for six months um, and then you can fix it up for the second semester. So that was a lot of information and now I'm going to pile on some more. Um, so this year we piloted a new alternative entry pathway in response to the pandemic, which admitted students into a degree on the basis of their year 11 results. Um, on the understanding that year 12 was obviously impacted in quite a big way this year. Um, this process has concluded. So if your child has an early conditional offer based on their year 11 results, they've already got it. If they don't have one, unfortunately, it has closed and there's no longer an opportunity to apply for it for this year. Something that is really important to note is that that offer must be formalised. It is currently conditional. The last remaining condition beyond finishing year 12 is that they still need to have that degree on their university application. So this is something I would definitely encourage you to put some questions in the Q&A about if you've got more detailed questions. But the short summary is that if the degree your child got their early conditional year 11 offer for is their first choice, that's all they need to do, that will automatically go through and be processed on that January 15 offer round. Um, if they've changed their mind or they want to apply for something else, that's also fine. They'll be assessed based on their year 12 results and we encourage them to put that year 11 pathway degree as a lower preference on their application as a safety net because they've already been issued an offer, they, they've got a place in that degree. So if for whatever reason they're not successful in gaining a place in other ones, that's their safety net and they're all sorted from there. Um, so as I said, please feel free to pop in some questions. It's quite a new process, so no, no worries at all on that one. So the other thing I just wanted to quickly highlight is the, the huge range of degrees that we have on offer in the Faculty of Sciences. We generally break them down into six different categories to give people an idea of which degrees are grouped in, in similar themes and disciplines. Um, so there's generally two types of degrees that we have available. So there are named degrees, which are quite specialised. So for example, um, the Bachelor of Agricultural Science, the Bachelor of Science brackets, Space Science and Astrophysics. So these are ones where we pre-built out the study plan for that degree. And then there's a few free choice courses in there, which we refer to as electives. So it's generally predefined, it's quite specialised, and you've got a bit of flexibility in there. Then we have the general degrees, which on the screen are the Bachelor of Science all the way down to the Bachelor of Science Advanced Honours. These are really highly flexible and customisable degrees. They actually have 19 different majors and double majors that students can choose from. So a major is a specialised area that you study within a degree. Um, these are the really good ones if you're not 100% sure what you want to do. So if your child is really passionate about science, but they haven't quite figured out where they want to take that passion, this is a really good starting point. We also have a large number of students who go into this degree, figure out what they like, figure out what they don't like, which is equally as important, and then they redesign the degree to suit that area of their interest. Um, there's, you'll see for when you look through our mental list, there's actually quite a few in the general science degrees as well. Um, our Science Service Hub is always happy to help support with those discussions. So the, the general bit of advice here is just to encourage your child to put a Bachelor of Science as one of their lower preferences if they just want to have it as a safety net. Even if it's in that sixth spot, it's just a nice little safety net for people. The last thing to talk about from me, and then I'll hand back over to Amanda, is our pre-arrival mentoring program. This is a new initiative that we've introduced this year. Um, we understand that many people haven't had the opportunity to come and visit the university in person this year, and that generally um, 
students are quite scared and that's really, really normal. It's, uh, it's quite a big change going from the very structured environment of school to the very independent learning environment of a university. So we've set up a program with eight current University of Adelaide students who are available um, free of charge for free of charge to have a conversation with. So we're using TAP or the Access platform, which is basically like a Facebook Messenger service. They just jump onto the website and they can initiate a conversation with any of the mentors that they choose and just have a general discussion. Our mentors have made plenty of mistakes. They've had the first day jitters, they've had all sorts of nerves. Um, you know, I was having conversations with them the other week, you know, we've had people accidentally enrolling in a third year subject instead of a first year subject, sitting outside of a classroom for 30 minutes because they thought it started in week one, but it actually started in week two, and people getting so ridiculously lost on campus that somehow they ended up at the River Torrens. So it's completely normal. Um, everyone's really nervous and we really do encourage your, your child to have a conversation with them. It, it costs nothing and it's just a nice little reassurance that um, how they're feeling is how everyone feels. I will just do a quick whip around and introduce you to our eight mentors, um, just so that you can get a bit of an idea of, of who they are. So Mariana is first up. She went through high school with a really strong passion for chemistry and mathematics and was weighing up all through year 10 through to 12 of which she was going to do. And then when she got to university, found out, she found out she didn't have to make a decision and she could just do both. Um, so she's doing what we call concurrent study, where she's doing a Bachelor of Science Advanced and a Bachelor of Mathematical Sciences at the same time. So she's someone that's really, really strong at managing her time and working through all those different priorities. Then we have Ella. Um, Ella is probably the student who knows the most about um, being nervous on her first day. She's from a regional town and she came from a year 12 graduating class of 16 into a lecture of over 500 people on her very first day. So it was quite a culture shock. Um, but Ella is someone who's really engaged and involved in the university community and has, has turned those nerves into a, a really sort of thriving time at the university. So definitely, definitely someone to talk to. Um, next, we have David. I'm not actually going to talk about David because you'll get to hear from him in a couple of minutes. But he is a really nice guy and he's got the best story out of everyone. Now I've set the expectations really high, so um, just putting him on the spot a little bit there. Then we have Stephanie. Stephanie is really passionate about working with people with disabilities and also people who experience genetic disorders, but it took her a few years to work out how she wanted to do that. Now she's studying a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science, and that's the way she wants to pursue that. She's decided she wants to pursue a career in medical research to try and improve the quality of life of, of people going through those different conditions. Next, we have Maddie. So Maddie is doing Agricultural Sciences at the Wake Campus. Um, Maddie's a great person to talk to about going above and beyond and taking advantage of opportunities. She's meant to be on university holidays right now, but she's pretty much non-stop doing volunteer and work experience opportunities all throughout her break. Um, she's a very proactive and hands-on person, so we definitely encourage you to talk to her a bit about how we integrate um, work and industry into, into studying. Um, then we have Megan. So, while most of our other students took a little bit of time within the sciences to figure out what they wanted, Megan actually started in a completely different area. So she was interested in a teaching arts degree when she first started her university career and then has moved along into the sciences. So it was quite a big shift for her. Um, so I won't tell you too much about Megan though because we do have her mum Carol here and I'm sure her, the quality of her stories and the level of embarrassment Megan will get when she finds out about them will be much, much higher. Um, next up is Delphi. Delphi is just finishing the, the third year of the Bachelor of Science Veterinary Bioscience and is moving into the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. So she's studying out at the Roseworthy campus with the goal of becoming a vet in another three years. She also lives at the Roseworthy College Hall. So if you'd like a bit of information about what it's like living in student accommodation, she's a great person to talk to. And last but certainly not least is Miriam. Miriam is someone who's taken quite a while to figure out what she wants to do, but has loved every minute of it along the way. She's done lots of different things and really accumulated a lot of experience. She's very passionate about her science, um, but it, to the point where it was almost detrimental when she couldn't make a decision about what she wanted to do. And she's really honed in now um, and taken advantage of a lot of volunteering opportunities um, and has a wealth of knowledge and experience about the university system. 
So that's all of our mentors. As you can see, they're just everyday people. They have had wonderful and interesting experiences. I've saved all the embarrassing stories for them to tell. Um, so your child can visit the website on the screen, which Amanda has also put on the chat um, for you to have a look at now as well. And they can go in and have a conversation with them. We really do encourage them to do so. And I'll hand over to Amanda. Thanks, Ari. So other than the, uh, obviously, our ambassadors are going to be a great resource um, for your child. We also have lots of support services at the university as you move into university life. And one of those is the Sciences Service Hub. And it's open Monday to Friday, and we've got a great team that sits in the Sciences Service Hub who basically help to provide face-to-face -face assistance as well as online assistance to our students. And look, I think, before I actually uh, talk about the different types of things that they provide advice on, I'd like to mention that it's really important to encourage your child to engage with any uh, service, the service hub, any support service, as soon as they feel like they need to. Don't leave it for too long. Early intervention is actually key to allowing us to help the student um, reach whatever decision or whatever advice that they need. So it's really important to make sure that, you know, we kind of encourage them to engage with the support services that I'm going to talk through. So in the Sciences Service Hub, we've got um, a quality team who let the students know about things like program advice, um, you know, if they're actually thinking about swapping programs, what programs could I think through and if they want to swap uh, once they've enrolled with us actually advice about enrolment and how to do that in terms of uh, which types of courses they might like to take. Our team is really good at developing study plans, particularly in the Bachelor of Science where we know they can go anywhere. So they can talk to the team and say, look, I'm kind of think I'm interested in X, Y, Z. So therefore we can help them develop that study plan and suggest which courses they might like to do. And that's really um, on the dot points there, a bit about course specific information. Also, let's say, you know, didn't read the timetable properly. Oops, I've missed that particular thing. I'd like some advice on how do I catch up on that particular practical, or maybe it was an in-class test. They can help provide advice on that. Um, there's a whole range of forms, just like everything in life. There's always some admin that has to happen at different points in time in life. And so um, the hub is there to help with the submission of various forms. And also if students want to transfer between programs. You'll notice we've got on the slide there study abroad queries. Um, so obviously we're still fielding study abroad queries where when we have the opportunity to send students abroad, again, we will always uh, suggest that as a, one of those sort of life experiences um, above and beyond what you get uh, here in Adelaide. So we are still taking those queries because not only are we talking about things like student exchange um, for a semester overseas, we're also talking about some of the study tours, which are courses here. Uh, in the Faculty of Sciences as well. Also, if students just have uh, general issues and they'd like a one-on-one -on -one chat, uh, all of our staff have been trained to have that confidential chat um, about those problems relating to their study. Now, that's the Sciences Service Hub, uh, which is very specifically about Faculty of Sciences problems. We also, within the university, have got a whole range of other student support uh, mechanisms uh, for your child. So the services um, really are aimed at just helping the student make sure that they're happy, healthy, and that they've got uh, a successful um, experience while they're here at the university. So in sciences, we do have uh, first year mentoring. So we do have some mentors which will help students in that first year reach out to them, help them with uh, networking, help them with learning more about uh, how do I submit an assignment? How do I use our university's uh, learning system, for example? Uh, so they're also, I guess, continuing what the ambassadors are doing, but uh, with the student once they're actually enrolled. We also have a whole range of academic support centres for the first year courses, things like biology, chemistry, physics, have all got uh, the drop-in academic support centres. And we also have peers who help um, with the study, and these are called PASS or peer-assisted study sessions. 
So we actually have this in uh, across the majority of our first year courses and also some in second year and third year courses uh, from next year. So I think that's also really great because they'll have a fellow student who may have already gone through the program and has learnt um, the tricks of the trade, if you like, um, along the way. We've also got at the University Maths Learning Centre and Writing Centre, which provide advice uh, on maths and writing or uh, English proficiency. We also have a counselling service, a disability service and the University Health Clinic. So if students are looking for that uh, extra support outside of the academic support, they have access to those as well as accommodation services and things like uh, careers, the career service, particularly if they're looking for a job uh, to help them in supporting um, their university life as well. So there are lots of different opportunities available to the student in terms of support. And I'll just reinforce, I guess, that um, really important to encourage your child to engage with those support um, services, particularly if they're finding something challenging, really important to engage because we're here to help the student, we want them to succeed, as I'm sure you all do as well. So my next thing really is just to talk through um, student finance. And look, the financial situation doesn't need to be a barrier to education. So what's happened here is when students receive their offer, they essentially um, have access to a Commonwealth supported place. So a Commonwealth supported place is essentially a subsidy from the Australian government, which um, either they either pay the student contribution uh, towards the full cost of their studies, and they do this either upfront or they can defer payment by requesting a HECS help uh, loan. So in order for that to happen, all CSP students must complete the request for Commonwealth support and HEX help form for each degree of study that they do. So it's really important uh, that they complete that to have access to that Commonwealth supported place for which they're being given the offer. So HEX help is essentially the Australian Government uh, scheme to help students in their uh, Commonwealth supported place to pay for their student contribution. Uh, and then, you know, they can pay that back later on once they reach a certain uh, amount of money in terms of their tax threshold. So it basically comes out as extra tax, if you like, later on in life. Um, the other types of financial things that uh, your student might want to think about or consider include things like Centrelink. So that provides financial assistance to full-time students, provided they meet various criteria such as personal income and asset tests or even parental income and asset tests and satisfactory academic progress. Um, Centrelink have obviously got their own website, but we just thought we'd raise it here in terms of that being a way of uh, trying to uh, provide finance to your child and they may qualify for Centrelink. There are also access um, through the Adelaide University Union um, Education and Welfare Offices. They can help with uh, thinking through student financial matters. So if a student has a particular financial issue, they can talk to those education and welfare officers who are employed by the Adelaide University Union. There's also a whole range of grants and loans. Again, the Adelaide University Union can help with that. And then there are also a whole range of scholarships and bursaries. Now, often your child might say, oh, but it's a scholarship. I'm not smart enough for that scholarship. Well, actually, it's not. they're not all merit-based necessarily. Some of them are also just based on the financial situation that a student may find themselves in. So um, I encourage that uh, you to explore that if you think that that uh, may be of concern uh, to you. And of course, if your child is just looking for some part-time work to help them um, make their way through um, university life, they can also um, link into the university's career service as well as the Adelaide University Union, which also has um, a service which helps uh, to students to find jobs as well. So you can find all of that information about student finance at um, the URL there as well. So I encourage you um, to make sure, I guess, that your child's aware of all of those different options um, because your financial situation should not be a barrier to education either. So we've talked about all of the student support. What I would like to do now is to introduce our two uh, guest speakers. We have uh, 
David, who's one of our ambassadors, and we have Carol, who's one of our parents. So I'm going to ask each of them um, to tell us a little bit about uh, their experience and shed some light uh, on certain sides of things. So I'm going to start off with David first, who is uh, in the Bachelor of Science Advanced, majoring in double chemistry, but I'll let David introduce himself and tell us his story. Thank you, David. Hi, so um, my name is David and I'm studying a Bachelor of Advanced Science. Now, as mentioned, a Bachelor of Science Advanced is a really broad degree, um, but I chose a double major in chemistry and I'm heading into my fourth year now and I aim to finish at the end of the first semester. I chose science as um, I really love understanding the world around me and like all the cool reactions that are happening all the time. And I think being able to understand that is something that really intrigues me. Um, also, I really like being able to help the world and by being a scientist, I feel like I can actually help the world and help hopefully do things that can improve our world. Um, on top of that, another thing about chemistry in particular is you're not just stuck at a desk 24 seven. I hate sitting down all the time. So being able to go in a lab, be hands on is something that I also really thoroughly enjoy. Uh, finally, and probably the last reason that I like doing science is the collaborations that you get globally. No one group just works by themselves when they're doing a project. Everything is done globally and people connect all over the world. So working with people in France or interacting with people in Japan, I find that a really cool scenario that I'm talking to people all over the world. Um, as of right now, I'm not actually sure of my exact pathway when I do finish my degree. But one thing that I'm really happy about with my degree that I've chosen is my options are so wide open. As it's a basic chemistry degree with anything around chemistry, I'm open to all different um, industries and all different companies. So I feel like my options are still really broad in what I could choose. Um, when I came to uni, it really was uh, quite a shock. The best thing about uni is the freedom. You can do whatever you want. Um, however comes that is independent. I think that can definitely be one of its most um, challenging aspects. The first major worry with my degree was its flexibility. As there's over 19 majors that you can choose from, it was really overwhelming once I got my offer. I spent like three hours just sitting at my computer, like trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and it was really just useless. I had no way of figuring out. So I went out and I went to the faculty office. I booked a one hour session there, sat down with them. And it was one of the best one hours I've ever had at the uni, sat down with them. They were so friendly, so helpful and made the uh, enrollment premise so much easier. And I definitely would not have been able to do it if I was by myself. Once I did finally enroll, my next um, big concern was getting lost on campus. The university is not small, uh, much bigger than any school I've been to. And it can certainly feel like a maze at some point. It got to the point that after my first week, I just had the lost on campus app actually just pinned in my home bar. So whenever I needed a building, I would just go on there, search for the building and it gives you perfect directions wherever you wanna go. So that's an app I would highly recommend telling your kids about because it is a lifesaver. Once you do finally make it to your class, even if you're 10 minutes late, um, the next thing is the lecture theatres are huge. There's over 300 students like sitting there. And I think the thing is everyone's nervous. And that's the thing that's really important to tell your kids is that everyone is just like you. They've just left school. So realising that was something that made it so much easier to sit down next to someone and just introduce myself. And another thing to remember about that is if they're in this degree, if they're in this room, they're most likely got some similar interest to you. So it makes it a lot easier to talk to someone because obviously they've got some similar interests. However, in saying that, some people may not feel as comfortable in doing that. So there's plenty of clubs and plenty of societies that the university offers. And there's legitimately a club for everyone. And that is definitely something I would recommend um, letting your kids do. Uh, there are so many clubs and I spend so much time doing them. And it means uni is so much more fun rather than just study. I'm also doing fun things as well. So you're more likely to come in uni because you've got some mates to hang out with and you're not just studying all the time. Finally, once you've got over those first couple of nerves, the next thing is the content. It's not easy learning, especially when it can be online like it is now at some point. Um, and it's really hard sometimes when there's 300 people sitting there, it's hard to know what you're gonna do. Um, but the one thing about this is the support services that the uni has. has. We've touched on them briefly a little bit before, but the maths learning center is a lifesaver. I wasn't bad at maths um, at any means, but coming to uni was just a whole nother kettle of fish and was something I really struggled with. I uh, went to maths learning center, you sit down there and someone comes across and they're just so helpful. Having another student that was in your situation three years ago, two years ago, usually they're doing postgraduate work. 
is so helpful because they can just help you through it and really give you that one on support that is so um, valuable. Additionally, past sessions are a lifesaver. Going to past sessions where they're run by students that just completed the course is so useful because you get some extra content. They tell you how you should focus on things and what's really important. And both of those services were so useful, especially my first two semesters, because getting it from a student that had just done stuff was so useful. And I think the overall key message to take away from university is it's quite easy to let it pass you by, but there is so many opportunities. And as long as you're willing to go out and get them, you can have such a fun time at the uni. Thanks, David. I, look, I think that was great. Thank you very much for that um, description, I guess, of where you're at uh, with your studies. I'd like to just highlight one thing I think that came out of that, which is really important, is that co-curricular experience that students not only engage with the support services that they also engage with, I guess, the sense of community that they can uh, raise at the university as well by being involved in all of the other stuff that happens at uni too. Really important. Thank you, David. I'll turn now to our parent. Um, Carol obviously is a parent of one of our um, ambassadors um, and that ambassador is in the Bachelor of Science Marine Biology and I believe Carol also has had two other children study at the University of Adelaide as well. So looking forward to hearing from you, Carol. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, um, uh, Tori, as well. And also, David, um, you had so many insights there that I could just relate to straight away and had experienced. I'm a bit of a veteran. I do have three children who are two are still currently at university. One's already graduated, so I've got a bit of a background on it. I'm hoping that I can share some insights and some and reduce some concerns that, that parents might have. I know that uh, when my first child went through, I was quite anxious about what he would anticipate or what he would be, be um, receiving and how he would progress through it. But um, I actually used him as a tool for my two other children. And I don't mean that in the tool sense. I mean it in that he's actually got lots of skills that he learned in the first 12 months at uni that he was able to share with his younger siblings. So that was really, really good. And it enabled me to be at arm's length from my sibling or from his siblings as well, but still keep an eye on what they were doing. So just so that they've got that guidance and support as well. So I'm hoping that some of the stuff that I talk about today might help the parents in the audience to feel a little bit more comfortable with what's coming. So um, 12 years at, at school, going to uni, as a lot of you would already realise, and David's already highlighted as well, is a different all game altogether. There are so many freedoms. You don't even know what you don't know when you hit the uni front line in, on the first few days. Um, but there's lots of things you can do to prepare yourself for it. So my best tips is to, are to encourage your children to be independent, be curious, be really, really inquisitive and ask lots of questions. And don't be afraid of who you're going to ask those questions of. It could be the, the, the student sitting next to you. It could be the guys in the hub. It could be your lecturers. It could be anybody that you can ask questions of to get better understanding of what it is that you're going to enter into, what some of the expectations might be from all of those people, as well as what your own expectations might be as a student. Um, and to just keep an open mind and, and just absorb as much as there is that can be absorbed there. Some key things that you'll need to keep an eye out for are to certainly visit the Science Hub because that is a wealth of information. If you have decided you're having a mid-year crisis and you think you need to change your degree, they're the guys to go and speak to and have a talk through. And sometimes it's just being able to talk to somebody who understands what this, that those science degrees are all about to marry those things together. Megan started in a humanities subject when she first arrived at Adelaide Uni. She quickly realised that that was not her, her gig and she wanted to go back to sciences and she's always been a science to, um, individual. So it surprises that she even started in the humanities. So keep in touch with all of those really, really good sources. The, the key thing that I took out of um, what Ari was saying earlier is email addresses. My third child didn't change his school email address, so he was missing a lot of information. So please make sure that your children have got a personal email address that they are checking regularly. Excuse me. <coughs> For parents, keep calm. Students don't share a lot of information with you. They probably didn't share much with you in 11 and 12 anyway. They share a lot less with you in, high, in um, university. Um, so the magnet on the fridge will be your guidance is to know to what step and what's coming up next. If you can get it out of their pack and get it on the fridge as quickly as you can. Um, and keep on top of the timelines um, that are on that magnet as well. So the enrolment piece, the, um, the, the books, the subjects, where they can get materials from, making sure that they get assistance to get materials. Secondhand books are a great thing if they're still relevant. So even look for that in terms of being able to save a bit of money. 
Um, if your student's thinking about their commitment to work, then you need to actually be able to balance that. So they might have a part-time job that they had through high school. That can still be there, um, but um, give them some other opportunities to look at other ways to be employed as well. As um, Amanda had said before, there are opportunities for employment within the university itself, but you need to look out, look out for those opportunities. I can remember Megan um, having climbed I've been down to Victor Harbour and she was excited as, as I don't know what about having penguin guano all over the front of her as she'd crawled through the bushes on um, one of the islands to count um, nesting penguins for, for a, 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 um, a scholarship that she was looking at doing. So she'd gone, actually gone out and, and volunteered to do some of that stuff. That's That wouldn't have phased her at all. I was just thinking a bit eek myself, but she loved it. So those opportunities are there and you need to, to look out for them and encourage your children to take, take part in them as well. Some practical stuff. Get your, get your students organised, get their student travel cards sorted out in terms of buses or trams or whatever that might be. Um, there are also some really good free um, services that are available. So there's the inter-campus bus, which is at Waite and Roseworthy, um, both backwards and forwards to those locations if your children happen to be out there. Um, there is a specific uni bus ticket that your, stu your students must have as well. So there are all sorts of things that you can help as a parent to get them prepared or at least to be focused on. <clears throat> Volunteering to do any um, volunteer work. I mean, the, the penguin counting was one thing, but there's volunteering you can do in lab groups. There's volunteering you can do. Um, I think Megan has just come back from having done a second stint up near Moomba, which is the Arid Recovery Centre. She volunteered to go up there a year ago and she's now gone up there independently with some other colleagues to go and invest her time up there again so that's there all the sorts of exciting things that relate to her science degree that she'd be involved in she's been doing that since she was knee height or grasshopper anyway she's done wombat or volunteers um, rescue service and all sorts of things um, but there's some of summer scholarships um, and they also enabled her to practice some of her lab skills to look at other scholarships that came up later as well so speaking to, to lots of different people is really important and it's the student that, that, that needs to be actually do that. And, and as David said before, not having that barrier to speaking to people because they're most they're, they're like-minded people already. So they're going to be, there's going to be topics of interest to you have, for you to have as well. Outside of all the study, as David also highlighted, there is a wealth of activities for people to get involved in. Um, there's volleyball group, there's um, badminton, there's football, there's, there's all sorts of um, sporting activities. So if your children are uh, sporty and have been all through school, there's no reason why they can't be just as sporty and have those connections, new connections that they're going to build through being at university um, sporting events and, and, um, and uh, clubs. Um, the one thing that um, Megan has managed to do, which I thought was really, really good, is that as of next year, she will um, be president of the Science Association for 2021. And she'll also be secretary for the Biology Society. So she's trying to build her experiences in terms of management and guidance and all of those things, as well as doing the mentoring program, which she was very excited about being asked if she would, if it would uh, be able to volunteer her time. So there's a whole world of things that your children can do and enjoy while they're at uni. So it's just a case of you keeping calm and, and hanging on tight and being there as the backstop if something does go pear-shaped. But most importantly, to remember that you don't have to be the specialist that has all the answers. You just need to know where to direct your child to be able to get those answers if you don't know what they are. Um, and today's um, presentation has been a wealth of information. I, I wished I knew or had seen as much as I'd seen tonight when I first started a little while ago. As I said, I'm a veteran in this space. And that's it for me. So um, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Carol. Lots of wonderful advice in there, um, and I'm I'm sure that that has definitely helped our parents that are online. Um, we're going to turn now uh, to a present, a sort of an audience, the audience Q and A, and invite uh, Carol, David, myself, and Ari basically to answer those questions. And Ari is going to facilitate that, so I'll hand over to Ari. Thanks, Amanda. So um, we've already had a few questions come in, so thank you so much. If you do have any more questions, please just type them into the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. It'll open up a little window and you can ask us questions in there. We also had a couple of questions submitted before the event, so we might address those first. The first one's for you, Amanda. Could you explain the difference between a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Science with Honours? Certainly. So Bachelor of Science is a three-year degree, whereas a Bachelor of Science with Honours, which is a direct entry program, is for four years. So it allows the student to do what is essentially the Bachelor of Science and then add on an extra year 
uh, called Honours, which is uh, a research project year. It allows the student to delve into much more depth into um, their area of interest. So in a Bachelor of Science, you'll get a major, and as uh, Ari mentioned before, there's like 19 different uh, types of majors, but then in the Honours, you can specialise by choosing what your research project might be, and that might be either in a research area or research discipline, um, usually with an academic or with industry, or it might also be within a um, professional pathway. Brilliant. Yeah, and it's just worth noting that if you don't go into that four-year package degree, there's there's no problems at all. You can always reapply for honours later if you find your feet partway through your studies and decide that research is, is, is the way to go. So um, it's just nice to have it from the front um, if people are in a dead set on going down a research career pathway, kind of like how Stephanie was really keen on, on doing research. So um, very flexible in that regard. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so there was another question about what double degrees are available. I might just quickly field that one. Um, so double degrees are all listed on our Degree Finder website, and you can also access that through a, a list of degrees on the Faculty of Sciences website. Um, so if a double degree is listed, that means it's available. We have to pre-design double degrees, um, and so we publish them all on the website once they're built. Um, and then another question that's come through, which will, I'll throw to Amanda since it's related, um, is what is the difference between a double degree and a concurrent degree? Okay, thanks, Ari. So um, as you've just mentioned, Ari, a double degree is kind of pre-designed. So um, academics have sat down and worked out which courses should be combined together to give you that double degree. In contrast, a concurrent degree is Basically, you choose to do two degrees. We had one of our uh, ambassadors or mentors there who had chosen to do mathematical sciences as well as uh, science. And so um, that was an example of concurrent degrees. We don't have those packaged together in a particular way, but we will have worked out a plan for that student. It takes a little bit longer to do the concurrent way but sometimes we're able to give credit for some courses, but not as it's, it takes a lot longer than if it is a planned double degree. Absolutely. And then I've got a question here for you, David. Um, so I'm just get you to pop yourself off of mute. Um, so David, can you describe how, um, casting your mind back to first year, um, what was the, the study balance like? So with how much independent study did you find yourself doing every week as sort of a, a ballpark in comparison to your time on campus? Um, I think it really depends on the time of the year that it was. Um, particularly around exams time, I found it really useful to always be at uni allowed me to focus a lot more. Um, but it also depends on how you like to study. I like to change my study environment. Um, I go to the, the three different libraries that we have on the campus. So the, there's a law library, which you can go sit in the Lara, the Hugh Harris library, I think it is. Um, and then I also like to study from home as well. But definitely after sitting at your desk at home for 13 years, fresh environments like the uni is really useful and like nice to be able to go sit at a fresh environment. So it definitely gave me more hours to study. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we've got another question here, which I might field, which is, um, can you please describe how deferring works? So if you remember before I was talking about those six responses on the SATAC application, um, I accept but wish to defer my place is one of those responses. Um, and then there's a similar one, which is I accept but wish to defer but wish to be considered for higher preferences as well, which is quite a lengthy one. Um, so basically what will happen is even after that, your, your child will still receive a university welcome email with their student number, their password. That typically comes within the first 24 to 48 hours. Um, however, they have deferred their place. So what will happen is towards the end of 2021, our admissions department will email your child asking them if they want to commence in 2022 or if they want to defer for an additional year. Um, so we handle that internally. And this is another reason why having that personal email address that they actually check is so important because that's how we get in contact with them. Um, so you can defer for up to two years before you then lose your place if you decide not to commence and you'd need to submit a new application. Uh, Amanda, can you please explain the difference between the Bachelor of Science and the Bachelor of Science Advanced? Sure. 
So the Bachelor of Science, uh, I guess, is the standard entry program to Bachelor of Science, whereas the Bachelor of Science Advanced is for students who we would perhaps regard as high achievers. Um, I'm not sure if I can quite remember what the ATAR is. It's either 90 or 95. 95. Um, and so um, students are high achievers. They come into that degree and they actually not only have the choices that you have in the Bachelor of Science, but they're also able to undertake research projects in the labs of um, at, or the field of academics uh, within uh, the Faculty of Sciences. So it's a, a slightly more advanced program in terms of, um, I guess, the types of things that the students might do in that particular program. And it's completely possible to switch from the Bachelor of Science to the Bachelor of Science Advanced at the end of first year. So if a student starts in the Bachelor of Science and yep. gets involved in those research projects, they can jump across as well. That's absolutely normal as well. Um, okay, and then we have a question for you, Carol. Um, so with you obviously being a veteran now, um, and you've seen a couple of a couple of kids go through this process. How long do you think it normally takes for them to sort of hit their stride and start feeling comfortable and, and feeling on, on top of things, if that happened at all, I should add? But. Look, I think that's a really good question. And I think for um, all three of them, they probably understood and were feeling comfortable after that first um, six months. Um, then they would, you know, there would be occasions where they'd, they'd be fired a shot from you know the outfield that they wouldn't expect and that would just throw them into a bit of a tizzy for a while um, but it's just a case of, of knowing again where to find answers to questions so um, it might have been that um, the a subject was changed or deleted from the program and they sort of went, well what do I do now how do I finish my degree that sort of thing um, small wobbles but they were all sorted out very quickly by having gone back to the hubs and, and discussing their, their uh, courses with, within that pro within the the group that are there to support them so yeah pretty straightforward really just have to go to make sure you ask the right questions to the right people no worries thank you carol um amanda when do students in a bachelor of science have to declare their major is it straight away or no so um what happens is i guess first year is kind of structured up in a in a way that allows the student to shop around a little bit if they're not sure you know they've got a choice of a number of first year courses and then Really, most students would start to think about what their major will be at the end of first year as they head into second year. And most of this is actually just about making sure that any prerequisite courses that they need in second year, that they're undertaking those so that in third year, um, they're ready to go with whatever major they might be. The reality is we've got a whole mix of students. We've got students who in first year go, this is exactly what I want to do. And they'll be picking everything up you know, exactly in that particular discipline right from the start, right all the way to um, a range of students who I guess actually go, hmm, I have no idea what I want to do. And they take a little while to get there and figure out what it is that they want to do with their major. And it might actually sometimes be only as they head into third year, they go, oh, actually, I need to think about a major now. And sometimes they'll sort of work retrospectively to fit whatever they've done to a particular major or they'll just swap direction. And really the Sciences Service Hub's very good at um, dealing with students and helping them point them in the right direction to get that major. The other thing that we do is towards the end of first year, we have a program called Next Steps, which allows us to talk to the students and we kind of, um, if you like, get them to have a conversation with uh, those people who sort of oversee the different major areas have that conversation and work out whether it's the major for them and give them some guidance on the types of things they need to be taking in second year. Brilliant, thank you, Amanda. So next up, um, we have a specific question about the year 11 results pathway. So I might jump in on this one. Um, so this is for a parent's son who has received an offer already for agricultural sciences and has that as their first preference, okay. Um, so yes, that is correct. You don't need to change anything because it's the first preference. That's the first thing he'll be considered for because he has the early conditional offer. As long as he passes year 12 um, and gets this, and gets all his grades, um, that will automatically be formalized and he'll be able to go through and get his offer into agricultural sciences. You don't need to put the Bachelor of Science as a lower preference backup choice, but for peace of mind, I generally do encourage it. Um, but it's entirely his choice whether or not he feels like he needs to do that. Um, 
as long as he's got his conditional offer and he passes everything, it should all be good. Um, but if he's a little bit nervous, it doesn't hurt to pop it on there um, as a redundancy plan if anything goes wrong, which it shouldn't. Um, and then there's a follow-up question as well. Um, so this is about the uni bus tickets. Um, so going between Wayne and Roseworthy. So um, there's also a, a personal thank you, Carol. This was really helpful to know, so thank you, Carol. Um, so what happens is each student is issued with a student ID card, which entitles them to discounts with Adelaide Metro. So once they've gotten their offer, they've gotten their account set up, they've enrolled in their courses, they can then come to the university and get their individual student card made. Um, that card then entitles them to those discounts as well as other concessions. So the movie theatres, they can get special student bank accounts, etc. Um, so that's used for core public transport. Then we have a University of Adelaide shuttle bus that runs from Waite to North Terrace to Roseworthy and then the other way at set times throughout the day. Uh, from memory, that's about $2 a trip. Um, and that comes at set times, particular at particular times throughout the day that they can they can get on. So there is a pretty rigid schedule. There's not a lot of flexibility because it's a long drive, particularly from North Terrace to Roseworthy. Um, just do keep that in mind. They need to be there at the right time. Uh, another one for you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for students to do two majors within one degree? Yes, it is. So. Um, a lot of our students actually do do two majors. Um, so there's a couple of options here. You, you can choose two areas that you're interested in, and that's just two separate majors. Or we also have double majors, which are, again, a very set um, combination of courses to give that particular double major. Brilliant. Thank you. I've got another question here for you, David. Um, so. The question is about practical sessions. Um, can you just sort of give us a bit of an overview of what, what a typical practical was like for you in, in first year, how long it was and, and the sort of things you would do? Yes, so a practical session in chemistry was three hours long. Um, and usually what happens is you come in and you have a whole bunch of chemicals at your disposal and the aim is to get to some final chemical by mixing the chemicals in front of you. Um, while you're doing that mixing of the chemicals, you'd write down if like there was some bubbles that appeared, if it changed colour, and then at the end of that um, session, you'd write a quick up report on what happened in the session, explain did it work, did it not work, and basically it takes about three hours long. Yeah. And were they weekly or? Yes. So practicals are run weekly, and sometimes there is a bi week where you just have your week off, but um, usually they're weekly. Yeah. Thank you, David. And then the next question we have, and we're getting towards the end of the question, so we'll just remind everyone if there are any more questions, please type them in. Um, we've only got a couple left and um, we want to make sure that we get to everyone. Um, so the next question, which I think I'll throw to you as well, Amanda, is uh, do Roseworthy students come to the city for classes? So do they come to North Terrace for classes? Okay, depends a little bit on which degree they're in. So if they're in the uh, Bachelor of Veterinary Technology, all of their degree is actually based at Roseworthy. If they're in the Animal Science or Animal Behaviour or Veterinary Bioscience degrees, then in their first year, they'll be doing uh, chemistry and biology and statistical practice, uh, maybe physics in one of those degrees here at North Terrace campus. Um, so there is, it depends on the particular degree, um, but we always make sure that in first year there is one particular day that they spend the entire day at Roseworthy, and that's usually in their specialty topic, whatever that might be, animal behaviour, animal science, for example. Yeah, and that's exactly the perfect time for them to take advantage of that shuttle bus as well. Um, so just as a little bit of a, a general piece of advice as well, um, especially if you have a child who's commuting out to Roseworthy, is providing that they don't get motion sick, it's really a good idea for them to try and use their travel time to keep up with their studies. Um, just to give them a little bit of extra time um, when they get home at the end of the day so that they can switch off and do things for them. Um, David's really hit the nail on the head with this one. The, the work study life balance is an important thing to maintain. Um, we see very often that many students come in and they go really, really hard at their studies, which is fantastic, but they don't balance it out with that social aspect and that social element. So they do need to make sure that they take time for themselves, just as they did when they were cramming and getting ready for year 12 exams. 
Um, time management is a really, really important skill. Um, during orientation week, there are sessions and giving some general tips and advice on, on time management and time management strategies as well. And um, we do encourage a child to attend those if they feel like they'd like a bit of extra support there. Um, but I mean, most students would describe going to university as a crash course in learning time management skills. <laughs> so um, as a little bit of extra peace of mind as well, um, and this is in relation to one of the questions that we have is that um, when they've enrolled in their courses within the degree, they then get access to My Uni, which is our online learning management system. And each course has its own profile in My Uni, which also includes all of the due dates and the deadlines um, for their particular um, course. So we do generally encourage people to either set reminders with at least a week's warning or have a big calendar of all their due dates up on the wall in their study space. Um, just to make sure that they're not caught off guard or, or, or thrown out by surprise for anything there. Um, so that was, a, that was a really good question on just when those assignments and deadlines are. Um, similarly, that also has a list of the required books for each course as well. Um, and as Carol mentioned, there are secondhand book sales available as well. Um, the only thing you do need to just keep an eye on is editions. Um, if you've got seventh edition and everyone else in the class is reading eighth edition, just Keep in mind that your page numbers may not always line up. The content should be pretty similar. Um, just yeah. flick back and forth as quick as possible until you find the right page. Um, that's how I got through my first year of <laughs> um, That is it for questions now. Um, thank you all so, so much for your questions. Um, just as a, a general reminder, we are available for help. Um, there is on the screen a variety of different websites and resources available. Um, the Science Service Hub, the Scholarships website. I will really, really um, put in a, a request that you that you ask your child to engage in the pre-arrival mentoring program. Um, as you can see, David's wonderful. Um, the other seven mentors are also wonderful. They're really friendly and they're, they're just so keen to help. So please just get them to jump on, ask some questions, have a chat. Um, they might message one week, then leave it two months and message again, and that's absolutely fine as well. Um, it's just there for them to have a bit of extra help and support. Um, but other than that, thanks, Ari. And I guess I'd like to just add a fingers crossed. I, I hope your child gets the results that they were looking for uh, tomorrow when the SACE results come out. So good luck uh, with that, and uh, hopefully we'll see them um, in classes at the start of the year. Thank you very much for joining us.